Hey humans, it's Hannah. Welcome back to my channel. Or if you're new here, I do videos on creepy and disturbing things. And today we are covering the Hart family. Most of you have actually probably heard of this case, at least in passing. It happened not too long ago. Most of us heard about it when it happened, but you likely don't know all the details of it. And you probably just don't know exactly how horrific this case really truly was. Before we get into it, I would like to start off by saying that I am not making any money off of this video. I did turn on AdSense for this video, but it's probably gonna be limited monetization because of YouTube's policies. They do not like stories like this, so it won't make a lot of money. But any money that this video does make from ads, I will donate to a charity, specifically the Prevent Child Abuse America charity. They are a verified nonprofit organization that helps specifically resources for children and CA in America. So any ad revenue that this video makes in the first 30 days, 30 days because that's when videos make the majority of their ad revenue and it would be really hard to track for eternity. So I'm going to donate any of that money to this organization. I will make my own personal donation as well as link their charity down below in the description. So if any of you watch this video and hear the story, if you have the means to donate any amount to them, then you can also, if you feel inspired to do that, you can do that as well. But I just wanted to be super clear as to why you may see ads on this video. And if you do want to donate without spending any of your money, don't skip the ads and then this video will make more money and more money will be donated. Pretty much FYI, I'm just finally now making enough money off of this YouTube channel where after covering all my bills, I can finally start donating to actual victim organizations and stuff like that. So this is also our Patreon poll pick for August. The Patreons picked this over on there and if you want early access and bonus content then go check that out I'll also have that linked in the description first we got to start off with Jennifer Hart she was born on June 4th 1979 and grew up in here in South Dakota she had two younger siblings and she would be baptized in her youth as a Lutheran she went to her in high school and after graduating would go to Augustana University however she would later transfer to Northern State University in 19 1999, where she would start studying elementary school education. However, she would end up dropping out of college and leave without graduating. Then we have Sarah Hart. She was born on April 8th, 1979. She would grow up in Big Stone City, North Dakota, and had three younger siblings. After high school, she would go to the University of Minnesota for only one semester before also transferring to Northern State University. She majored in elementary school education just like Jennifer did, which is presumably how the two met in the first place. The only difference was that Sarah was actually specializing in special education, so for children that needed extra support, and she would finish school and end up graduating. So Jennifer and Sarah would start dating very shortly after meeting at Northern State University. They quickly hit it off, and it was also pretty quickly apparent to both of them that they were each other's love of their lives. They were soulmates, and when Sarah graduated in 2002, the two women were moved in together and they stayed together. In 2004, the two would move to Alexandria, Minnesota together, where they would both work in retail. It's when they made this move that they decided to finally come out to all of their friends, family, and their coworkers about their relationship, that the two women were gay, and that they were happily together in this partnership. In 2005, Sarah would go get her last name legally changed to Jennifer's last name since marriage was not legal in their state, so they couldn't officially get married. So the two, you know, they're in it for the long haul. They've committed to each other. They've told each other they're going to be together forever. Now, here's a pretty unknown fact about these women. Before adopting all six of the Hart children, they were actually fostering a 15-year-old girl in their home. But because they were planning on adopting all those children, for whatever reason, they decided that this foster child wasn't a good fit for them. So just one week before the first three siblings that they were due to adopt would arrive, at their home, they would drop their 15 year old foster daughter off at a therapy session, not telling her anything. And they would leave it to the therapist to let this 15 year old girl know that Jennifer and Sarah were not coming back for her and she was gonna be put back into the system. I can't imagine being that poor girl and hearing that news. However, knowing what we know now, 
we know that she actually, it was a blessing that she didn't have to stay in this family. Also, mind you, I don't know much about the foster system. It's very possible that the therapist or some other professional telling a foster kid they're going back into the system is common for them to say it and not the foster parents to say it. I have no idea. It's just reading that from a non-biased point of view. I'm like, that seems really sad and mean, but Anyway, in September of 2006, they would bring in their first set of three siblings, three-year-old Abigail, four-year-old Hannah Jean, and eight-year-old Marcus. They were placed from Colorado County, Texas into the Hart home for permanent adoption. Then less than a couple years later in 2008, Jennifer and Sarah permanently adopted three more siblings, this time from Houston, Texas. This time it was three-year-old Sierra, six-year-old Devante, and four-year-old Jeremiah. So the second set of siblings actually did have a mother who loved them very much, but unfortunately she had a very, very big drug abuse issue and she was just unfit to care for them. And also because of this, I don't know exactly what happened, but the courts decided that she wasn't even fit to see her children at all and that she was to have no contact with them. However, everybody did agree that the children would be best staying with family. And so originally Sierra, Devante and Jeremiah stayed with their paternal aunt and they lived with their aunt for a while and the aunt by all accounts was a good home. She was nice to the children, she cared for them very well and they, it was just best for them because at least they would be with the family still and it was somebody that they knew and was familiar. However, one day this aunt would make a really big mistake. She let the biological mother not only visit the children but visit her three children without the aunt present. They were caught by social workers and authorities immediately took these three children away from the aunt and mother and just stuck them right back into the system. These three children actually also had a fourth older sibling named Dante, another person in the story that a lot of people don't talk about, but he was never adopted into the Hart family or even considered because he had so many behavioral issues. Anyway, to me, this is just ridiculous and we'll show you the first time that the system would fail these kids. Like I said, this aunt was providing a good and stable home for them in spite of this very bad mistake that she made. And I think most people would agree that it would still be better to leave the children with family, even if they had to watch them a little more carefully and everything, or maybe she'd get some sort of fine or whatever for breaking the agreement of the courts or whatever. Most people would agree that would still be better if they were able to stay with family than just get thrown and taken immediately away from everything they've known, the place they've been living, and then just thrown into this whole new family. It just seems really unfair to me. These kids had been through a lot before they even got to Jennifer and Sarah. Anyway, in 2009, after they had all six children all set up in their home, Jennifer and Sarah would travel to Connecticut and officially legally get married as it was legal in Connecticut at that time, but not yet federally legal everywhere. Sarah would become a manager at a Kohl's department store. And at this point, Jennifer quit her job and she was a stay at home mother. The reason that they could afford this is because the government was helping them out, giving them funds for all the fostering and adopting they were doing. Another important thing to note is that Jennifer and Sarah cut off all contact with their respective families around this time. And what's kind of odd is that both families were not homophobic. They were fine with the two women being together. They were supportive of their relationship, but they would later say that the reason they cut off contact was because they were critical of some of Jen and Sarah's parenting decisions. So before we get more into that, we first need to paint this picture of what the family wanted everybody to believe on social media. The two women worked extremely hard to make it look as if they had this perfect life and a perfect family. 
very active on Facebook, especially. On Facebook, they would post many photos of the whole family together, all just smiling from ear to ear. They would post pictures of the family on all the fun family trips they'd go on, music festivals, political rallies, protests. The children, especially Devante, but a lot of the children were often wearing free hug shirts and were seen photographed hugging a lot of people in all their adventures and just being these wonderfully kind, warm, friendly children. So to the world, they made it look like they were just these incredibly selfless people. Two people in love who, instead of having children of their own, opened their home to all these kids with difficult upbringings. One post on Facebook for the ninth anniversary of adopting three of the siblings, Jennifer would write, I'm a better human in every possible way for knowing these children. They have been my greatest teachers. Contrary to the common notion that we can't choose our family, we absolutely can. We choose by loving and it's worth celebrating every damn day. She would post a lot of this kind of thing. It was mostly Jennifer on Facebook trying to control the narrative of how the world saw them. And it was pretty clear looking back that Jennifer had major case of white savior complex. She would post these extremely dramatic posts on Facebook with all this language that would make it seem like these kids were just getting the best life and wanted to make her seem really selfless and wonderful. But if you kind of read into them a little more, there were very subtle lines of her basically saying, look at what I did. All these kids of color that I brought into my home, they were all drug babies. She would actually call them that sometimes. And they wouldn't have had any sort of good shot at life without her. I'm mostly paraphrasing here, of course, but if you saw some of the Facebook posts, you would understand what I'm saying. One of her Facebook posts that had a picture of the kids had reportedly said, if not us, who? As if these kids would be doomed without them. In 2014, 12 year old Devante would become a national sensation when this photograph was taken of him, hugging a white police officer with tear streaked cheeks. The photo was taken in Portland, Oregon after the Ferguson protests. The day a grand jury did not charge Ferguson police officer Darren Wilson in the shooting of 18 year old Michael Brown. The image was soon labeled as a hug felt around the world. Even if you don't know the story of the Hart family, you most likely recognize this photo. It was a symbol of hope for everybody around the nation when everybody seemed to be on polar opposite sides. It showed these two sides uniting together and literally hugging it out. Too bad it was all a facade. Knowing what we know now and the alleged that I'm about to go into, we're not even sure that this hug we see is consensual. Not by the police officer. I'm sure the police officer in this photo is fine, but we don't know if Devante was like coerced into this by his mother or forced into it by his mother. That statement will make more sense as this story goes on. But basically the second the camera would snap a photo of the happy smiling family, all six children would reportedly instantly go back to frowning. One accusation would say the children, when not posing as the perfect family, often looked quote unquote lifeless. In reality, all of this Facebook social media stuff was a complete cover. In reality, all six of those children were terrified of Jennifer and Sarah. They were very likely trained to act this way in public in fear of what would happen later at home if they didn't. Other than the deaths themselves, this is gonna be the hardest part of this video. So I know there was a warning at the beginning, but I just wanna warn you again that this next section is gonna be hard to listen to. I'm gonna be describing very upsetting and in some cases specific accusations of CA against these children. While the details are extremely disturbing, I don't feel like I can leave them out. I honestly would, but I think it paints a very important picture of what these women were actually like. And I also think it paints a very clear picture of the motive for taking all of their children's lives later. Now, like I said, YouTube does not like stories about this and especially not details like this discussed. I will have to censor some of the words and I will also be saying CA instead of 
as I have been, but just FYI that that's what that means in case you missed it in the beginning. Again, just in an effort to at least not get age restricted. So we've been talking about this happy family this whole time when these accusations would actually start all the way back in 2008 when the family was living in Minnesota. Hannah, who was about six years old at the time, was asked by one of her teachers why she had bruises all over her arm. She told the teacher that Jennifer had hit her with a belt. A few months after this incident, Jennifer and Sarah would pull all six children out of school for an entire year. In 2011, the kids were back in school, but Abigail would tell some people at school that she had quote unquote, owies all over her stomach. She would tell people she was scared of her adopted parents. And sure enough, she not only had bruises on her stomach, but on her back and her buttocks as well. Jennifer had allegedly beat Abigail because her and Sarah believed that Abigail stole a penny. At this point, police finally started investigating. The children would tell the police that they were constantly spanked and also not given enough food. Taking the rap for both of them, Sarah said that she was the one that hit Abigail, even though Abigail claimed that it was Jennifer who did it. But Sarah would admit that she let her anger get the better of her and she took Abigail into the bathroom and leaned her over the tub to spank her, but she spanked her too hard, which is why she had bruises both on her stomach from leaning over the bathtub and on her buttocks and back as well. She would plead guilty to assault and she got one year of community service and some probation basically a slap on the wrist and no jail time. A lot of you, just like me, are probably confused by this. One year of community service for what was clearly full-fledged CA going on in this home. But first of all, this case, like I touched on before, is a notorious example of the system failing these kids. Additionally, she pled guilty, so she got a plea deal, which resulted in a lesser sentence. That's the US court system for ya. However, I agree with what most of you are probably thinking right now, that because there was solid proof of CA and Sarah even admitted to some of it, why were these kids not taken away immediately and forever out of this home? Then the next complaint would come in. Hannah would again go to school and this time she would tell a school nurse that she hadn't eaten all day. When confronting Sarah about it, Sarah would say that Hannah was lying and that she was quote unquote playing the food card and that they shouldn't give her more food, but rather just give her some water. After this incident, Sarah and Jennifer would take all six children out of school permanently and the six children would be from then on homeschooled. It was very clear that they wanted to get away from all these adults and other people that the kids could go to when they weren't around and tell them about all this stuff that was happening at home. And the only way that they could successfully control the narrative is if they all stayed sequestered at home together and there was nobody the kids could talk to without the parents there. 2013 rolled around and the kids had been living in Portland at this point. Remember, it was 2014 when the famous Devante picture goes viral. Oregon authorities actually were told about the accusations from Minnesota. So Oregon authorities started investigating the family. They would interview both members of the family as well as people that knew the family. Two different family friends would tell investigators that the children weren't even allowed to wish each other happy birthday. They were forced to raise their hands before they said anything and they weren't even allowed to laugh while they were at the dinner table. The biggest and most consistent accusation against the two women was was that they simply were not giving the kids enough food. Not for lack of food, their fridge was full of food, but that the kids were not allowed to have it and they were often just not fed enough. On one occasion, Jennifer did order a pizza for the kids, but she would only allow each child to have a very small slice of pizza and that was it. So of course, as the children were starving, one of them snuck down at night and ate the rest of the pizza. Jennifer would punish all six children by not giving them breakfast the next morning. And all six children were also forced to lay down on their backs on an air mattress together with their hands down and an eye mask over their face for five hours. 
However, like I said, the children were being interviewed and this was being investigated. But when authorities asked the children individually, they were interviewed individually away from the parents. The children said that they weren't being a they said that nothing bad ever happened in Minnesota and that they were just fine. However, these children, while they were technically separated from Jennifer and Sarah, they were still interviewed in the home with them not far away. So the kids, of course, with kid logic, they would think that their parents would be able to hear what they were saying to police or that if they told the police whatever they don't know, that they're not gonna just turn around and tell their parents this. So they probably, most likely, felt like they had to say that their parents weren't doing anything out of pure fear of them. When Jennifer was interviewed, she would, of course, blame everything, all these accusations, all this stuff that people said about them on homophobia and racism, that everybody didn't like that it was a lesbian couple raising six children of color. Anyway, because all the kids said that nothing was going on, authorities couldn't really do anything. And again, nothing was done. So then by August, 2017, the whole family would move to Woodland, Washington State. Shortly after moving there, again, it was little Hannah who tried to get help for her and her siblings. One night, shortly after moving in, Hannah would jump out onto the roof of their second story and fall down from the second story onto the ground. And this was at 1.30 in the morning to run to a neighbor's house. When they answered the door, Hannah would plead with them to not make her go back to her house. She would tell them what was going on and say that both of her parents were racist against their own children. Jennifer and Sarah would soon realize that Hannah was out of the house and they would go retrieve her from the neighbor's house. She convinced the neighbors that Hannah was lying. She would tell them that Hannah's biological mother was bipolar, that all six of her children were again, quote unquote, drug babies. And therefore, because of that, nothing that any of them said could be trusted. How convenient. The neighbor said that at the time she did believe Jennifer because Jennifer was so manipulative and charming and convincing. Hannah was then forced by Jennifer and Sarah to write a formal, like written apology to the neighbors and go deliver it to them. And in the apology, it said like, sorry for disturbing your peace. And I was telling lies and all this stuff. When the neighbor got this, the neighbor was still suspicious that Hannah was like, coerced into writing this. So she asked if she could talk to Hannah alone. And of course, Jennifer and Sarah said no. They do everything as a family. She can't talk to Hannah alone. Then in the days leading up to the tragedy, these same neighbors would start getting very frequent visits from Devante. He would beg and plead them for extra food. Not only extra food, but if they could hide the extra food by the fence in between their houses so that he could sneak out and get it when Jennifer and Sarah would know so that they would never find out. This was the point where these neighbors realized that Jennifer was likely lying about the earlier incident. Something sinister was going on in this home and they would contact Washington State DSHS. We had an incident before with um, an evening uh, situation that made Dana very concerned about what was going on next door. And then about a week ago or so, um, one of the children came over and started uh, asking for food and it went on for a period of time until we kind of determined that he was probably reaching out and we determined to that we should call the child protective services and that's what we did on friday and then at this point, it finally felt like the system was going to try to do something. But sadly, it was already too late. DSHS would show up at their house on March 23rd, 2018. But even though the SUV was in the driveway, nobody would come to the door. So they left a business card in their door frame. When DSHS would return the next day, the hearts and the SUV were gone. On March 26, 2018, Jennifer, Sarah, and all six of their adopted children would be driving in their GMC Yukon XL when all eight of them would drive over a 100-foot cliff on the California State Route 1 in Mendocino County, California, close to Westport, 
just after 3 a.m. in the morning. Marcus, Jeremiah, Abigail, along with Jennifer and Sarah were all found inside of the car, which had landed upside down at the crash site. Sierra was found later nearby and Hannah was only partially found. Skeletal remains of her foot still in its shoe would wash up on a California beach months later, along with her blue jeans with a little H marked in the tag. The rest of her remains were never recovered. Devante's body to this day, as of filming, is still missing, but a superior court judge would determine that he was in the car at the time and was also declared legally dead. We can only assume that Devante got swept into the sea. Family and friends, of course, were absolutely devastated and just shocked to learn of what happened. At first, Everybody that knew them was absolutely sure this must have been some sort of tragic accident. And that's probably what Jennifer and Sarah would prefer everybody believe. But the subsequent investigation of the SUV would very quickly uncover the truth. The computer system in the car showed that the car was stopped before the cliff and then accelerated with the gas at full throttle. The car was going 90 miles per hour when it went off the cliff and there was also no brake marks or skid marks on the cliff where the SUV had been to indicate that the driver was trying to stop or that the SUV had somehow spun out of control. The investigation also found that none of the eight family members were wearing seat belts. Jennifer was driving the Yukon and Sarah had been in the passenger seat beside her. A 14 coroner jury would unanimously agree that the case was a murder with Jennifer and Sarah both having committed suicide and all six children having been murdered. Now, in spite of the fact that it's clear that this was an intentional crash, there's also some more indications that this was premeditated and that the two women had been planning this at least for several days and that they didn't just do this spur of the moment and decide. First of all, Jennifer had a very high alcohol content in her blood, they found. She had a 0 0.10 blood alcohol level and the legal limit is 0.08, so it was much more than the legal limit as well as the fact that Jennifer was not a drinker. She was not known to drink, so clearly she was probably drunker than the average person on this amount, and clearly she did it on purpose. Sarah, as well as the children that they were able to test, were all found to have very high levels of Benadryl in their system. It is believed that Jennifer and Sarah drugged all six of the children at least an hour prior to the crash, and that all six children were likely either unconscious or fast asleep when it happened. I have a feeling that that's the reason Jennifer drank alcohol and Sarah and all the kids were drugged because obviously Jennifer couldn't have carried this out if she was had fallen asleep or whatever. So she wanted to be intoxicated. So she chose alcohol instead. The other thing is that Sarah had been making some pretty damning Google searches before this happened. She had been researching death by drowning as well as researching how lethal Benadryl could be if you were to take over a certain amount. She also searched no kill shelters for dogs as both of the family dogs were found unharmed in the home after the deaths were discovered. Don't get me wrong, I'm glad the dogs were okay, but I find it incredibly telling that the women cared more about what happened to their dogs than what happened to the six actual human children that they vowed to care for and keep safe. Anyway, all of this stuff together along with the investigation tells us that it's very likely this was all premeditated murder. It is important to discuss how it, there is quite a bit of evidence to suggest that Jennifer was the real ringleader and the real mastermind of this whole thing. She was extremely controlling and she made all of the rules for the family. According to coworkers and others, Sarah did seem pretty withdrawn and she was just quieter person in general, but she also seemed almost scared of Jennifer as well. A report would later come out about Sarah that she had apparently told this coworker that she wished someone had told her that it was okay not to have a big family because if they had, she and Jennifer would have never adopted all of those children. So we can conclude that Jennifer was likely a Sarah as well, if not physically, at least emotionally and psychologically. So in a way, Sarah was actually a victim of Jennifer too. However, before you come for me, 
I totally think that you can be a victim and a perpetrator at the same time. It's very difficult to look past the fact that Sarah didn't try to save the kids if this was in fact all of Jennifer's doing. She was still complicit in this crime. She still drugged all her children and helped Jennifer put this plan into motion. I cannot help but think that she could have and should have done more to stop Jennifer if it was in fact that Jennifer was the mastermind and Sarah was just an innocent bystander going along with everything. And because I highly doubt that, I honestly think that Sarah did agree with Jennifer and was in on the whole plot and wasn't some victim, at least at the very end, and that she was helping Jennifer. That's speculation, of course, but the other question, of course, is just like, why? If the two women were just so hell-bent on getting out of this situation, why didn't they just Thelma and Louise it by themselves and leave all six children alive and give them a second chance at life? It would have ended the exact same way for Jennifer and Sarah if they had let the kids live. This is probably par the part that makes me the most furious. And this is, of course, also speculation, but based on what I know about true crime and studying cases like this, I would guess that the women had a very controlling view of the kids. And just like we know, they tried to control them. So they thought, well, they're an extension of me. And if I can't have them, then no one can. So they're coming with. It was this weird ownership over them, that they felt the right to take their lives too, and that it would only be right to take their lives too. I also think, of course, that the women were very scared that if they went off and ended their own lives and left the children behind alive and well, they knew that the kids would tell the truth about the household and what Jennifer and Sarah had been doing to them. Again, of course, this is incredibly selfish and just evil to take their lives over that, but we know that Jennifer was extremely obsessed with controlling the narrative around how other people viewed her and her family, but most importantly her, and how she was such a good person and blah 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 blah. So she would have done anything to stop them from knowing the truth. And even though we do kind of know the truth now, at least this way, we don't have solid proof and we have to call it all speculation because there's nobody here to speak to it. However, I do like to think that Jennifer would be very pissed to know that we all had her figured out. It's also bizarre that if you look around some places, there are people that defend these women and claim, well, we don't know the whole story. We don't know what was really happening. They were so, you know, they had mental health issues and blah, 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 blah. And it's very bizarre that there are people that it's like they're like child killer apologists. It's very weird. To me, I don't see an angle of this where anybody could defend the women, especially Jennifer. I just wanna remind everybody that there's just no defense for what these women did. Maybe these two women were simply bad seeds and we just have to accept that. When they passed, Sierra was 12 years old, Abigail was 14 years old, Jeremiah was 14 years old, Devante was 15 years old, Hannah was 16, and Marcus was 19. All right, everybody, so that's that story. Yeah, I don't know what else to say. I'm just gonna end it. Thanks so much to all my patrons on the screen. Special shout out to Top Tears, Colin Holmes, Deck of Cards, Michelle Valdovinos, Tom L, JJ, Quasi Eli, Little Kittle Cat, Delta Wolf 776, Mitchell Schaefer Meyer, Mike, Alice Paul, Dark Sided Otter, Brittany Phillips, Willow Winchester, Amanda Klein, Bambi, Nianu Kianu, Momo Nia, Philip J, Covey, David 88, Sonder, Marita 144, Sage K, and our newest, literally Lacey. Bye, everybody.